tonight we have chronic wasting disease in deer with Mike Samuel, recently retired from UW-Madison Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology, as I said it last time. I think we've had every professor in the department here. So Dr. Mike Samuel is a native Californian, and he grew up just a couple of miles from Disneyland in the orange groves. He grew up hiking in the Sierra Nevada and got hooked on outdoor adventures and fishing. And he had a thing for wildlife and had lots and lots of pets as a kid, including otters and raccoons and skunks. But his undergrad degree was actually in um, computer science from Berkeley. He went on to get to UC Davis to get a master's degree and then on to get another master's degree and PhD from University of Idaho, Idaho studying elk and learning how to do the statistics necessary for applied, um, for assessing wildlife populations. He came to Wisconsin and got involved in wildlife pathology in a co-op unit together with US Geological Survey, Wisconsin DNR, and UW. He started studying chronic wasting disease, or CWD, as you may hear it tonight, in 2002 as it moved into Wisconsin, mostly from the western states and mostly uh, from elk and mule deer. And though not from Wisconsin originally, he's become something of a Northwoods guy, spending time uh, up here fishing and recreating on the Chippewa over in the Hayward area. Okay, so here's your trivia question. Mike Samuel has been all over the world working on wildlife. And he was working on a project in far northern Russia, investigating the health of snow geese that sometimes came down with avian cholera. Who knew geese got cholera? I certainly didn't. He was working on Wrangell Island, a large but very remote island <clears throat> off the north coast of Russia in the Chukchi Sea up near the Arctic Ocean. He and his team were collaring and radio tagging a bunch of geese and vaccinating half of them to see if the type of tag mattered and if the vaccination was effective at keeping them healthy. All this had to be done in a small window of time when the birds were molting and so they couldn't fly. What adventure befell his group while working on this project? He was stranded for several weeks because the helicopter pilot refused to return and pick him up. B, the plane lost its GPS and landed in Canada instead of Russia, and they ended up studying Canada geese instead of snow geese. <laughs> I know, it was pretty lame. Or one of the geese got sucked into the engine of the plane and the pilot had to make an emergency landing on the ocean and then they made a movie about it. Oh, no, that was the Hudson River, so it was sucking. So he was actually stranded for several weeks on uh, the island waiting for someone to come back and pick him up. Thanks so much to, um, to Michael Samuel. It's all yours. <clears throat> Thanks, Susan. Thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. It's a real pleasure to come up here and get a little dose of snow again. We've run out of snow in southern Wisconsin, so, but we have benefits. Our bluebirds are back and uh, woodcock are back and things like that, so we're a little ahead of you. Just one correction. I actually retired from the U.S. Geological Survey um, as assistant unit leader at the Wildlife Cooperative uh, Unit in, at Madison, and I'm currently um, emeritus professor uh, in the department. I also had a faculty position in the department as well. Um, I, as Susan said, I've been working on chronic wasting disease for 15 years. Uh, our goal has been to try to understand the disease and how it works and try to see if we could develop some management strategies to, to do something about the disease. So we do really pretty much applied uh, kinds of research. Um, we've published probably about 30 or so, more, thir more than 30 papers on the disease. Um, so I think we've learned quite a bit over the years, and I'll try to share some of that with you tonight. Um, there's a wildlife disease class at UW-Madison in which I talk about prion diseases for an hour, and I talk about chronic wasting disease for an hour. Susan told me I can't do that tonight, so I'm just going just to give you the highlights of some things, and hopefully we can talk more about the details. Maybe you'll have some questions. So how many of you are deer hunters? Maybe a little audience participation here. Well, not as many as I thought for the Northwoods. Okay. How many of you have heard of CWD? <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> okay. How about prions? How many of you know what prions are? I've heard of prions. Oh, great. That's actually pretty good. So I think it's, it's good to start out with prions a little bit. 
Um, prions are a very unusual thing for us disease guys. They're, they're not a virus, they're not a bacteria, they're just a protein. And so it's kind of weird that we have something that's just a protein that causes a disease, but it does. Now, prions, we all have, all mammals have prions, and they have, we have what we call normal prions. And they perform some function in our body that we're not really sure. Science really isn't really sure exactly what they do or why they're there. But we know they're pretty important because there's a sort of a conserved genetic structure that uh, produces them throughout the animal kingdom pretty much, or mammals. So we know they're important, and we know that they, um, they do things in the body, um, but they don't live very long in the body. They have a very short half-life. They get degraded by protease K. They're very readily, de readily degraded. Um, and so they just sort of go around and do their thing and then just disappear. That the problem occurs when some of them become misfolded. And when they become misfolded, the body can't get rid of them. In addition to that, they're misfolded in the, in the shape that's very similar to the prions um, that the body has normally. And so they're not recognized as a foreign substance. And the body doesn't do anything to fight against them. There's no immune response or anything like that. So that's sort of then the origin of this disease. But they don't have any DNA and they don't have any RNA. So how do they replicate themselves? How do they reproduce? How do we get more of them? Well, they do a very unusual thing. They, they, the misfolded prions, or the infectious prions, somehow bind on to the normal prions in the body, and they cause them to misfold. And we don't really understand exactly how that works yet. We're still trying to understand this fairly new disease. So they cause the normal prions to misfold, and then those bind to other prions, normal prions, and cause them to misfold, and then they sort of form chains or aggregates in the body. And that's how we get sort of these disease agents that occur. They're aggregations of misfolded prions, and they go out through the body, and again, in ways that we don't completely understand, whether it's through the blood system or through the nervous system or the lymph system, we're not really sure. And eventually they get to the brain, and they cause problems in the brain. And that's what generates these prion-like diseases. Now, prions are the agent of a disease that we call transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. And the reason I don't have another beer up here, because I couldn't say that if I had another beer. So they're transmissible because they can go from individual to individual. They're called encephalopathies because they affect the brain. And they're called spongiform because what they do to the brain is they cause holes in the brain to occur. That looks like a sponge. And as you can imagine, that's pretty much fatal when an animal or a person or anybody gets a spongiform encephalopathy. So um, there are several of these prion diseases around. Some of them affect animals. Some affect people. There's a disease of people called creutzfeldt jakobs disease that occurs in about one in a million people and actually causes the spongiform encephalopathies. There's also uh, prion diseases in sheep that we call scrapie that have been around for many, many years, um, hundreds of years, um, that are also transmissible spongiform encephalopathies or TSEs. Now, these um, diseases are pretty unique, and prions are pretty unique because they, they're very hard to destroy once they become misfolded. They're not destroyed by the body. They're not destroyed by the usual things that we do to get rid of bacteria and viruses like UV or bleach or things like that. They don't work. So they, they tend to hang around, not only in the body, but then also when they get in the environment and cause pro potential problems. So... Chronic wasting disease then basically is formed um, because of these prions. And they're a particular kind of prion um, that causes their prions that affect cervids or members of the deer family. And they're the only known prion or TSE disease that affects free-ranging animals. And in North America, the animals that are affected are our deer, our elk, and moose. And recently, it's been found in reindeer in Norway as well. So it's typically, be, before Norway found it, which has been very recent, it only had been in North America and only affect our deer species or our cervid species. So um, the disease really, er, we're, we're not sure how it's um, originally got here or where it came from. We'll talk about that in a second. But it was originally um, discovered back in the 60s when they had a... a um, 
uh, research on mule deer out in Colorado, and the deer were sort of wasting away and weren't surviving well. And people just thought it was a nutritional problem. So they tried to give them better food, and that didn't work. They just basically wasted away and died anyway. So it took about 10 years or so before they actually found that this was actually a disease agent, a prion, that affected the animals. And then about a decade after that, they discovered it in wild animals as well. And so for quite some time, probably until about 2000, pretty much all of us thought that this was a disease that just affected animals in the West, primarily Colorado and Wyoming until we found it in Wisconsin from the hunt of 2001 in the fall when um, three deer were shot near Mount Horeb that were all affected with the disease. And then in 2002, we did more surveillance and found that it was more widespread than we thought. Now, it's hard to say how long it's actually been in Wisconsin, but our best science tells us it's probably, it was probably here for at least two decades before we actually found it. It's another interesting story about how it was actually found. It was almost an accident how it was found. They just decided to do surveillance in that particular area because the person doing the surveillance didn't want to travel out, out, uh, throughout the rest of the state to do the surveillance, and she lived near Mount Horeb. So that's where the surveillance was done. So that's how we discovered it. So once an animal gets infected with a prion disease, it basically ingests an infected prion. Um, we'll talk about how that might occur in a, in a couple different uh, ways. Um, that then in infected or that misfolded prion binds to the normal prions in the body and causes this chain reaction problem and spreads throughout the body. It gets into the lymph, lymph system fairly early um, and then it eventually works its way up into the brain. For white-tailed deer, that process typically takes about two years before the animal becomes sick. Until that time, it's really not obvious that a, that a deer is infected with the disease. When they do become, during the clinical stage, they do become skinny. They're very unaware of their surroundings. They can, um, you can almost walk up to them in some cases and they'll sort of be startled and wake up. But they're, they're very in very poor state at that point in time, and, and death is usually a couple of months away um, when they get to that point. So what happens with this disease, though, however, the animals who are infected with it, even early in the disease, we're not sure how early, but very early, within a couple of months probably, certainly by six months, they're able to transmit the disease or infectious prions to other animals. So they had, there's, there's probably several ways that occurs. Deer are very social animals. They like to interact with each other. They like to groom each other, particularly the deer they know. And so their saliva is one of the most infectious secretions that they have. And so if they groom other deer, the other deer then can pick up the disease that way. They also are, the infectious secretions are in their urine and their feces. So there's other ways then they can also contaminate the environment and the deer might then get uh, infected through the environmental contamination from mineral licks or salt licks or things like that, or food piles where animals are salivating or urinating or other things. So contact with other animals and then indirectly um, through the environment are ways this disease is transmitted. Now, some people have said that these diseases are not highly infectious. Chronic wasting disease is not a highly infectious disease. In the big picture of all diseases, that's true. It doesn't compare to things like influenza, and measles, and smallpox, and those kind of things. But in terms of transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, it's the most contagious one we know of. And animals do get infected. We're not sure how much dose it takes, but we, knew, we know that they do get infected fairly readily. So the disease can spread then amongst the population of animals. So typically what happens in this disease, and, and We've done a lot of uh, science to try to figure out um, what is a sort of a driving factor of this disease. Initially, when this disease was discovered in Wisconsin, there was a, we sort of thought that this was what we call a density-dependent disease. In other words, if we reduce the number of deer, we could reduce the number of deer that were infected, and then that, that would actually cause us to get rid of the disease in theory. And what we've discovered since is it's not really a density-dependent disease. It's what we call a frequency-dependent disease. And that means that it's not the density of infected deer that drive, the, drive infection. It's actually the prevalence of the disease. 
So if we double prevalence, let's say from 5% to 10%, then the rate at which new animals get infected doubles as well. And so what happens with the disease is that it starts out really slowly, with very low prevalence, maybe get introduced by a few animals, and then the prevalence slowly builds, and then it gets to an acceleration phase, because as prevalence increases, the rate of infection increases as well. And that acceleration phase is what we're seeing now in southern Wisconsin, where the, where the disease is continuing to go in prevalence. It's also spreading across the landscape as well. So that acceleration phase then is where we sort of really begin to recognize that problems can occur. Now, we have two different outbreaks in southern Wisconsin. We have one in sort of west of Madison and sort of south central Wisconsin. And there's one that straddles the Illinois border, Wisconsin border, and we sort of point back and forth about who started it, right? But basically, those two outbreaks are growing together. The disease is spreading across the landscape, and they're kind of coalescing. And of course, it's spreading to other parts of the state, too, because um, this is a very difficult disease to manage and control. It's very, a very challenging problem. So who gets infected, and what, what does that mean? Well, what we know about the disease is that older animals, because they've had longer times of exposure, they're the ones that are most likely to get infected by the disease. So the older males and the older females, for example, they're going to be the ones that are more likely to be infected and have higher prevalence. Younger animals, not so much. Particularly things like fawns and stuff, um, particularly early on in the disease, don't really have any much evidence of infection. So it's older animals, and it's really not because they're more vulnerable. It's just they've had longer time to actually pick up the disease. So what else do we know? We know that males get infected at a lot f faster rate than females as well. It looks like males get infected at about three to four times the rate that female deer do. And to be honest, we don't have a clue as to why that occurs. There's some theories, we have some ideas, but we don't know for sure. The what we see in prevalence is that males have about twice the prevalence. So you're saying, okay, wait a minute. They get infected at three or four times the rate, but they only have twice the prevalence. What's going on? What's going on is that males die a lot quicker than females do once they get infected. And we're not sure exactly. I mean, there's other things that kill deer when they get infected with disease. It's not always chronic wasting disease. It might be predation. It might be hit by car. It might be pretty severe winters and those kind of things that affect them as well. They're more vulnerable to other, other uh, causes of mortality. It's kind of the best analogy that I've heard is it's kind of like somebody with Alzheimer's disease. People don't typically actually die from Alzheimer's, but they die from complications and other things. And that happens to deer that have chronic wasting disease as well. So the other thing we know about these diseases, and this is pretty typical of all the TSEs, is there are genetic factors involved as well. So scrapie, if any of you know about scrapie and sheep? Anybody? So scrapie is something that has a genetic component to it. There are some genotypes of sheep, and there are some genotypes that are of deer that are more resistant to these prion diseases, to TSE diseases. We don't understand exactly why that is. It has, we think it has to do with the shape, of the shape that the prions take in the animals. But they seem to be more resistant. But as far as we can tell, there are no genotypes that are immune to it. Everybody gets effect infected eventually, but some genotypes get infected at a much lower rate. And once they get infected, they survive for a longer period of time as well. And of course, because there's environmental contamination, and that's one of the routes, and direct contact is one of the routes, one of the concerns is, well, these, it, it's, maybe it sounds great that some of these deer are going to live for a longer time, and that is good from a population perspective but they also might be transmitting disease to other animals for a longer period of time as well. And we don't understand, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't understand how that's going to work very well in the future as probably our population change. So it's another thing that we're trying to learn about with the, with the deer is how the genetics might work and what kind of deer populations we're going to end up in the future. One thing we know is that these genotypes that are, that are resistant or not as susceptible, are, very, are fairly rare in the population. They're not in the balance that we would expect um, to occur just naturally. If there was just random mating of deer by genotypes, they're, they're less than abundant than we would expect them to be. So there's concern that there's something else going on with those deer, 
that maybe is not, they're not as fit as the other genotypes would be. And so this may have some long-term implications for where CWD may go in our deer herd. So the other thing we worry about, of course, is what the impact of this disease has on our deer and what it means for things like hunting, recreational hunting, and the deer population. So there's been four studies done, completed in the West now, and there's a study that's starting up um, down in southeast or south central Wisconsin this year, the DNR study, to look at the effect of the disease on our deer populations. The four studies in the West um, have all concluded that when CWD gets to a high enough level of prevalence, particularly in the females, because that's the animals, those are the animals that are producing fawns, um, when the pre prevalence gets high enough, then basically re we see reductions in the deer population. So in some of those populations, they've actually had to reduce the amount of hunting pressure that those populations can withstand, and they've actually had to back off quite a bit on hunting of adult, adult bucks in particular, and pretty much in some of the mule deer populations, their trophy animals are pretty much gone. So from a, from a point of sort of view of sort of trying to manage the deer population, from those of us who like to hunt and like to put deer heads on the wall, this disease is doing something that's very, very much antagonistic to that. It's affecting our older animals, and it's affecting our males at a lot higher rate, and it's killing them at a higher rate than it's killing our females as well. So we have some, we have some issues that are coming in the future with this disease as the, as the prevalence continues to increase in southern Wisconsin. Our predictions are that we're going to see some population impacts just like they've seen in the West. In the West, they've seen this for mule deer, They've seen it for elk, and they've seen it for white-tailed deer. All, all three species have had the same problems as prevalence gets, prevalence gets higher. And so I think this is something we're going to have to eventually figure out how to deal with as well, and I don't think at this point we have any solutions for this disease. Um, I mentioned a while back that it's what we call a frequency-dependent disease. And so what we want to do to try to manage it is try to reduce prevalence, and that's a very challenging thing to do. Um, one way we could think about reducing it is we could go out and capture animals, and we could test them, and we could find the ones that are positive, and we could remove them. Sounds great. It might, be work, it might work if you had a captive set of deer. But in free-ranging deer, that's uh, very, and particularly the, the density of deer we have, that's very time-consuming and probably not very worth, worthwhile. Um, one other idea that's at least surface is can we do something about reducing the number of bucks because those are the highest prevalence and that's probably a, a, a potential biological solution but it's not very popular um, amongst the hunting public of which I'm, I'm one of myself. Um, the only people who have really had good success with this disease are New York State and probably hopefully um, in northwest Wisconsin where people seem to have found infection early and been fairly aggressive at trying to remove deer and hopefully getting rid of the transmission cycle and getting rid of, rid of the deer that were positive. So that's the, that's the only successes we've had so far. Otherwise, the pattern seems to be that the disease spreads and the prevalence increases, and eventually we get population impacts um, that occur from the disease. The disease now, although I said in, in 2000, it was really only found in Colorado and Wyoming, we now have it in 25 states in the U.S. It's been found. Two Canadian provinces. It went to South Korea from Canada. Of course, we gave it to Canada, quite frankly. Um, and, well, they gave us scrapey, so, you know, it's a trade-off a trade that we got. Um, and now, now Norway is the foreign country. And I think Norway is still searching for the origin of CWD. And that's one of the questions that people also ask. Where did this come from? Has it been here all along? That's what some people think. It made, this is just, we just now have better ways to test for it. Well, the deer don't act like it's been here all along. The deer have genetic resistance to it, some of them. That's not something that we would see if the disease had been here all along. We see this disease spreading across the landscape from the focal points, just like it's a brand new disease, just like it's something that got introduced, not something they've been experienced for a long time. Some people have said, well, maybe it's a spontaneous disease. The human form of TSEs, Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease, apparently is spontaneous, probably from a genetic mutation. Well, that's a possibility. Where would we expect the disease to be most prevalent 
if it was a spontaneous disease. If it was spontaneous disease, we might see it to be the most abundant where we have the highest density of deer, because that would be the best chance for it, uh, spontaneous cases to occur. But the biggest deer populations we've had historically are in the southeast. And until Arkansas recently discovered they had the disease, it hasn't occurred in the southeast. It's, been in, it's occurred in low-density deer populations in particular out in the west. So it doesn't really fit the pattern very well. It's still certainly possible, but it just doesn't seem to fit. Another possibility is that it came from scraping. So we know, have, have, have any of you heard of mad cow disease in, in England? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's the one that got our attention, right? The Canadians, I think, lost about $50 billion when they had a few cases of mad cow disease. So it has big, big economic impacts. Um, so there's a lot of evidence that suggests that mad cow disease may be originated from scrapie as well. So, and there's been some studies, there's some evidence that suggests that that is one possibility. People have experimentally fed scrapie to deer and find that they come down with a disease that looks a lot like CWD. So it, it probably will, we'll probably never know for sure where this disease originated from. But um, that seems to be at least sort of one of the more popular theories these days. Um, another thing we talked about, a little bit about environmental contamination, particularly with urine and feces. Well, people have recently shown in the lab, and so it has a lot of work yet to do, people have shown that prions can actually be, um, go through the roots of plants and be uptaken to the leaves of plants. So there's potential for agricultural implications from this disease as well. If, for example, um, deer are contaminating the landscape, um, it could get into some agricultural plants. And many of us think that this is sort of maybe where our next big policy issues might come with chronic wasting disease, beyond the deer, the deer population issues, but um, potential for the involvement of the agricultural uh, system as well. So one question you guys might ask is, what, what would wolves do about this disease? We've got a lot of wolves up here. I think last time I heard, anyway, you had quite a few. So we don't really know. Nobody, we don't have CWD in any area where there are wolf populations. People have done some modeling studies and other things and suggest that potentially wolves might control CWD or might at least have a big impact on it. We would suspect that wolves are pretty good at finding animals that are sick, certainly, so animals that are clinical, but maybe even animals that we can't tell are sick. They're not behaving quite right, so maybe they could remove, they could differentially select some of the infected animals and help reduce prevalence. So that's the suspicion, but we don't really have any data to sort of validate that yet. We know of several of the studies in the West that I mentioned where actually cougar predation was a very major factor in the death of animals that were infected with CWD. Did that help control the disease? It didn't help prevent it. It didn't slow it down a whole lot, as far as we can tell, but maybe it did some. We, we didn't, nobody went in and removed all the cougars and then said, OK, what, now what happens? We don't have the experimental data. So it probably had some impact, but probably not a huge impact. Would wolves be different? Potentially. They're a very different kind of predator. Not a sit-and-wait predator, but more of a search-coursing predator. So that's certainly possible, as well. Another question I think that people always ask about is, what about human consumption? So we know, for example, that mad cow went from cows to people. The chances of that happening were quite rare, but yet the consequences were very serious. And the science really isn't very complete. We don't make people guinea pigs and feed them infected deer. Some people volunteer to do that, um, but we don't do that intentionally and we don't monitor them. So we don't really have good science. We have to do other studies. We, so we, we, we feed primates, which sort of come up with mixed results, and we do a lot of laboratory studies. So I think most people who study this pretty hard would conclude that the risk of humans getting infected is pretty low, but we can't say it's zero at this point. We just don't have that level of confidence. It's very hard to say something is a non-risk, right? Anyway. Um, so we think the risk is probably low, but probably not, maybe not zero at this point. Now, the World Health Organization and CDC both recommend that people not consume known infected animals. Okay, but um, that 
yeah, if somebody's laughing. <laughs> yeah, I have, lot, I have lots of people I know who come to meetings on CWD and stand up and say, our family's eaten CWD-infected deer for the last three years, and we're still fine. <laughs> so, um, you know, to be honest, the, the, when the DNR gives people a test back, result back positive on their deer, and the people report to them, that um, they consumed the deer already. Thanks for letting them know. Um, their name gets put into the hopper that goes to CDC, and that's somebody on the list that is known to be uh, consumed infected material, and we'll see eventually what happens with that. Hopefully no, ever, no human will ever become infected. Um, that would be the best thing to occur, but it's, uh, it's not a zero chance. Um, okay, I've, I've probably ran... <laughs> rambled on longer than, than um, people wanted, and maybe we could take some questions. So as far as functionality of the normally fo folded protein, have any kind of knockout studies been done? Uh, yes. So, uh, n yeah, knockout studies have been done, and the animals that have uh, been knocked out seem to function normally. So. This brings up this mystery of exactly what does this protein do, um, and that's really hotly debated now in, 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 in terms of science. I think the other sort of sort of spin-off of that is that um, there's a lot of similarities between this disease, between TSE diseases, and things like Alzheimer's, and so people are looking for potential models that might um, help us understand Alzheimer's as well. But we don't, we don't understand a lot about the molecular activity going on. We don't understand very well the structure of the proteins. We don't understand how they, the misfolded ones bind um, to the fold, the normal ones, and cause them to misfold. So there's a lot that, are, that we don't know still, for sure. And that, yeah, that, I kind of stay on the ecology side, so I, don't, I don't, probably don't have the latest on that, but that's my, that's my sort of understanding now. Yeah, um, one of the first deer farms that they found um, <clears throat> CWD on has now been bought by the state or the DNR, and it's being used as a test plot or test land, I think, kind of as a basis. Um, and it's, there's a, how long do prions live if they live in the soil? You were talking about coming up through a plant. Okay, how long do they live in the soil and... Is there any, been any random sampling of soil in non-CWD areas to see if these proteins exist there? So we don't have great information about how long CWD prions live in the environment. There's been some laboratory work done that suggests that they get degraded slowly with things like weathering and rain and those kind of things. We know that, they, that scrapey prions, which is probably a pretty good model, live in the environment for at least 16 years. People have removed sheep from scrapey infected areas and brought them back 16 years later and they became infected again. We know in Canada, for example, that people, the people who have deer farms have gone through quarantine periods of five years or more, brought animals back in and they've become infected. So we, we know it's fairly long-lived, um, but we don't really know like what the rate of decay is and those kind of things. The particular farm that you mentioned, the Hall Farm, yeah. is I think the one, yeah? Um, yeah, the state bought the farm on that one, for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> as far as I know, it's still sitting idle. It's the, the reason they bought it was because the owners threatened to tear the fence down um, if they didn't buy it. That was sort of the, the hook um, that was told. Um, and so they, there's been talk since, since then of doing some kind of experimental studies there, but, but nothing has really been done. The DNR kept telling many of us, well, you guys should do experimental studies here, and you should go find the resources to do it. And we kept saying, well, wait a minute, this is your property. Don't you have invest some investment? Maybe if you fund the research, maybe we could do something. But, um, but anyway, as far as I know, it's still sitting there um, just being sort of guarded, if you will. Yeah, you had a follow-up? Is that the DNR's farm or the state of Wisconsin's farm? Oh, that's because a good question. We're I, looking at two different pocketbooks there. Yeah. 
My understanding is this DNRs, but I, I, I don't really know the answer to that for sure, to be honest with you. The legal, the legal side, I don't know. I had two things. Um, you were talking about a knockout study. I don't understand what that is. And uh -huh. the other question is, if these prions are in the soil or, and you grow plants there and then people eat them, could they get it? So um, knockout studies basically refer to uh, animals where the production of prions is removed, genetically removed. And so they don't have any prions in their body, basically, is what's referred to. And they seem to live fairly normal kinds of lives, and they don't get in infected by prion diseases. It was sort of one of the proofs that prion diseases were this protein and not something like a slow virus or other things that people have hypothesized. Um, I'm sorry, the second part of your question was? If, if the prions are in the soil, oh. any yeah. So there's a, we, there's a concept we call the species barrier with prion diseases in particular. Um, and we don't understand it very well. So what it means is when a prion disease jumps from one species to a new species. So mad cow disease that went from cows to people um, jumped the species barrier. Cervid, the, the CWD among cervids, it affects uh, deer, elk, moose, both species of deer. That's, jumps, that's jumping those species barriers. Can it jump other species barriers? Can it come to humans? I think, I think we, we think that the risk of that is very low, but we're not sure that the risk of that is zero. And it wouldn't be different, as far as we know, it would not be different if it was in plants or animal tissue. So the, the thing that worries us about these species barriers is that we understand very little about them. So for example, if you take prions from mule deer um, and you try to put them into hamsters, hamsters don't get sick. If you take the same prions from mule deer and you put them into ferrets, the ferrets get sick. And if you take the material, the brain material from the ferrets and you put it back into guinea pigs, the guinea pigs get sick now. And so the species barriers concept are very fluid and, we're con and it's, it's, a, it's impossible to predict what, happen, what might happen if some other species gets infected and what that might mean for the other species, what it might mean for humans, what it might mean for other animals that might consume them. As far as we know, things like dogs, so canids, wolves, coyotes, fox, are not susceptible to any of these prion diseases. And partly it has to do, we think, with the shape of the, uh, the molecular structure of the prion itself. Some of them just don't, are not compa very compatible. Birds don't seem to have, ostriches, ostrich I think is maybe an uh, example, they don't seem to have the same kind of prions that mammals do. It's pretty much a mammal thing. Um, and interestingly, some of, the, um, some of the African species, for example, became infected with, from mad cow disease that was probably fed to them when they were in captivity in zoos. Cats got infected, for example. Um, although, having said that, um, Colorado has several live cougars that they've maintained for probably a decade now that they've fed infected deer to constantly, no problems. So, so uh, these things are, we just don't have enough information about how these things operate. And I think that's one of the things from a scientific point of view kind of concerns us because we, it's hard to say what might happen next when we don't, this is really a, a new disease to us. It's hard to say what might happen next in terms of both the ecosystem or, or um, livestock system or those kind of those kind of things as well. We have a question online. Yeah. Um, in your opinion, our wild uh, is our wild deer herd better served if we eliminate captive deer herds? And how close are we to being able to test a live deer for CWD? So um, <laughs> I'm going to start with the second question first. Uh, we can test live deer. It's not easy. The, the best test we have is basically on dead animals. Um, the lymph nodes seem to be, lymph nodes at brain material are the best tests we currently have. So if you harvest a deer and it's tested, um, typically what they'll do is they'll take out what are called the retropharyngeal lymph nodes, which are the ones that are right here. If you get a cold or something, 
still underneath your jaw. And when those things get swollen up, that's, that's your retropharyngeal lymph nodes. Pull those out of deer, and they're probably infected um, within maybe four to six months. So fairly early in the cycle. But that's pretty much something you can't do in a live deer. You can't remove their lymph nodes. So what do we do for live deer? Um, we can take a tonsil biopsy. So you reach down their throat and pull off a piece of their tonsil. If you get enough of the tonsil, then you can look at it under a microscope and see if they're infected. Or we can do what's called a rectal biopsy. and take. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's some lymph nodes in the rectum that they can remove and test, and that seems to be a little less reliable than tonsils. Um, and uh, another procedure. But none of these things are simple. They all involve capturing deer. What, what we really need is some kind of a, what I like to call as a dipstick test, is where a hunter could take it out and take a drop of blood and, you know, a little litmus paper test and say, oh, this animal's infected, this animal's in. We're a long way from anything like that. The other thing I should mention about this disease, it's, it's basically incurable. The animal doesn't react to it in any way. We don't know how to make the animal better, and we don't have any vaccines. And we're a long way from having a vaccine, I think, as well, particularly one that would be feasible to use in the field, but that's an area where we probably need to devote a lot more resources than we have been. Captive deer. <laughs> it's a hot topic. Um, I don't have a scientific opinion on captive deer. Um, my personal opinion is that I follow the Wildlife Society guidelines, and I think that captive deer are a significant problem. We don't shoot livestock. Um, I don't think we should shoot captive deer. I don't think we should have captive deer personally. That's just my personal opinion. I think I sort of follow the North American model of wildlife, which is the wildlife belong to all the people and not to individuals who put up fences. Okay. As a hunter, uh, the recommendation is when you harvest a deer and you clean it, that you're supposed to avoid the brain, the spine, and the nodes. And, yeah. um, if that occurs, even if the deer has CWD and you take the meat, are you fairly safe? The second question is, <laughs> when you shoot a deer, do you have it tested? Um, so if you shoot a deer that's infected and you're processing it without gloves, um, the blood is infected. Most of the organs have infectious material. Uh, part of this has evolved over time because our testing procedures have gotten much more sensitive. So the, the, the tissues that are most infected are brain and lymph tissues and, and nervous tissues, spinal cord and those kind of things. So that's why you hear these recommendations to avoid those, and those are good ones. Those are the most infectious, infectious material. But we've also found that meat... Uh, is infective. I mean, muscle has a lot of lymph nodes in it and a lot of blood flowing through it. That uh, has been shown to be infectious. Uh, antlers have been shown, velvet on antlers has been shown to be infectious. Um, so that's how we got it to Korea. Um, so as far as, far, as far as we know, most of the tissues that you're going to be um, processing uh, are going to be in, have some infectious rela infectiousness related to them. Uh, I do test our deer we shoot. We've shot three positive deer, and we, don't, we do not consume them. I, I wouldn't, even though the risk is likely low, um, it's not something I would give to friends or family. But, but that's a personal decision. Everybody makes that decision. Are, are you familiar with the uh, study in Texas on prions and infected deer? Um, where they found, where the, they found an area where there were deer with CWD, and uh, the prion was found in the soil. They attempted to eradicate it from the soil, but they weren't able to do that regardless of whatever uh, bleach or whatever they did to the soil. They waited a year, came back, and it was still there. I am I'm not familiar with that one. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to get it from you or get a reference from you later on that one. Um, I can tell you we have a, a paper... Um, that we're about to submit where we tested uh, mineral licks in southern Wisconsin and found quite a number of them to be infected, have infectious prions. And if that is the doesn't case... Doesn't surprise your, your, your conclusion doesn't surprise me. Uh, and if that's the case, it would only follow that, as in uh, west, east of here, where they found a CWD-infected deer on a game farm, that they should probably close the game farm, 
and kill all the deer there and not let any more deer in? Well, once a, a, my understanding is, I, I, don't, I have to admit, I don't follow the captive regulations very closely, but my understanding is if a, an, an infected animal is found, the farm goes under quarantine and no animals are allowed to leave the facility um, in, a, in a live condition. Um, and I don't, I, don't know, I don't know the regulations about bringing new animals in, but, but basically it's a sort of a game changer, I think, for that particular farm. Hi, this Hi. is a question from my friend Denny at the library, and it's regarding the captive deer population and the epidemiology or the origin of uh, CWD in Wisconsin. Uh, he used to live in a farm northwest of Blue Mound State Park back in the 1970s, and at that time when farms were being bought out, when people sold their farms, uh, private uh, investors were trying to create a quality hunting preserve. Uh, this was a, actually the foci of CWD in Wisconsin. And can you confirm, which I think you might have mentioned in passing, that the DNR wardens shot six mule deer back in the 1970s, early in the history of CWD? And the follow-up question is, mule deer are not native to Wisconsin, so would you agree that these mule deer that the DNR may have shot were from western states? If they were mule deer, they would have to be from a western state or from another captive situation, of course. Um, I think this, when we originally found CWD in southern Wisconsin, law enforcement people did a lot of investigating because the original thought that is it must have just got here like within five years or something. And so they followed up a lot of things about quality deer management. There was rumors that people brought in big white-tailed deer from the West and released them for genetics. I hadn't heard a story about mule deer. It doesn't mean it didn't happen, it just I didn't, haven't heard it. Um, so, and a lot of other you know, captive farms and a lot of other things were sort of rumored to be possible about how it, how it got started. Of course, a lot of hunters, particularly in, in southern Wisconsin, also have traditionally gone out west to hunt elk and mule deer and other things and would bring the, bring the carcasses back. And another possibility is the infected carcasses got distributed on the landscape. I don't know that we will ever track down how it came to Wisconsin. I think it's just been too long. Um, and I don't have the, the details on all the investigations that the, the legal people did to try to follow up, but I know they did a, a, a lot of work to try to follow up on some of those leads and some of those thoughts. So you don't know if the DNR did shoot? I, hadn't, I haven't heard that, but that doesn't mean it doesn't, didn't happen. I, I'm certainly not privy to a lot of that stuff, so, yeah. Question here? How hopeful you, are you for the future that we may be able to manage dis this disease in the next, you know, 10, 20 years, or are you preparing the public to become accustomed for the state of Wisconsin to have relatively low deer population for years to come? Unless we can find a silver bullet, I think it's going to be tough. So a silver bullet like a vaccine that we can easily distribute or something like that. I'm not aware of any solutions that are not extraordinarily painful for hunters. Um, and that's why, you know, it's been very hard to get the hunting public to, to buy into doing something about CWD. And so the, the problem, as I see it, is we have a long-term problem. Of we're either going to have to figure out how to control this disease and how to manage it, or it's going to begin to affect our deer herds, and we're going we're to have some pain on the hunting side that, in, in that respect as well. We're going to have a lot of infected deer on the landscape, we think that probably within five years or a little much longer, we're going to have most of the areas in southern Wisconsin where, it's, where it sort of originated, what we call the core area, where we're going to hit probably prevalences of 40 to 50 percent in males. We have some areas now in Iowa County that have gotten to that stage already, and probably 25 to 30 percent in females. And at that point, we're going to begin to see impacts on the herd. And then most of the animals that people are going to be shooting are going to be infected, and you have to make these decisions about 
do you ignore that? Do you consume it? What do you do? Um, the, the problem, I think, is that I'm not aware of any biological solution that's easy. Everybody would like to see this sort of just go away, but nobody wants to sort of pay the price. Um, the biology says that if we can reduce adult bucks and older, bu older, older bucks dramatically, that we can bring prevalence down, and then that brings the infection rate down. And if we do that consistently, we can eventually bring prevalence down to a manageable level. Because this seems to be what we call a frequency-dependent disease, it doesn't look like we will ever completely get rid of it. We're going to have to learn to live with some level of it. The question is how much we want to live with and what we're willing to pay to get to that level. Um, and how big a deal having infected animals on the landscape is. So I'm, I have to be honest, uh, given the, the climate, I think in terms of you know, wanting to do something, I'm not real optimistic. Um, that in terms of managing this disease in Wisconsin, southern Wisconsin in particular. My optimism is right now that many states who have sort of ignored this problem for a while and hoped it would go away are now beginning to realize it's not going to go away and it's going to be a big problem. And so there's a lot more momentum in places like Montana and Wyoming and, and Arkansas and Missouri and Michigan and maybe they can get some momentum. We had a, we had a national plan for this disease um, in 2002 when it was discovered east of the Mississippi River. And that sort of national plan has sort of evaporated. And if we could re-initiate that, we could probably make some more progress on maybe finding some other solutions or finding other ways to combat the disease. What I tell, so I was just in Minnesota a few weeks ago. They've found now an, a, a, a sort of a new area where they have it. Looks like it actually came from Iowa rather than, than Wisconsin, maybe. Um, I encourage them to, you, you have got a, just a few animals that are, that are potentially infected now. Be very aggressive about trying to take care of this. It seems to be in a small area. Deer are a renewable resource. We know how to have more deer. We just back off on hunting for a few years. and We can have lots more deer. So if, we can, if they can get rid of that disease, it may be only for a while, because it may come in from Wisconsin and Iowa again. At least they can keep it from becoming established. And once it gets established, it's, it's, it's just really difficult. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question or not. Yeah, um, you can move away from policy for a second. I have kind of a simple question. I'm just curious, you talk about the abnormal folds. Are they, does it look the same every single time? Or are they different? Oh, good question. Um, so what happens is it's, um, and we're getting a little outside of my area here, I have to say. So um, what happens is it misfolds, but it misfolds in a way that's almost unique to that particular animal. So it, the, the genotypes of the animals seem to have a slightly different misfolding. The species of the animals seem to have slightly different misfolding because it mimics the prions that they have normally anyway. And so they're all slightly, they're, they're somewhat different, but they still have enough similarity that if we give mule deer prions to white-tailed deer, they still get infected. If we give the GG genotype of white-tailed deer to the GS genotype, they still get infected. So they're slightly different, but there's enough, it has to, we think, people think it has to do with how much difference there is in the shape of the molecule and then some of the pieces of the molecule and how they might bind together, but not very, not real, not real lot of information on that yet. Did that, that help at all? Okay. What will the importation of elk, which is a big movement in Wisconsin, what will that do to the spread of this disease? Well, we know that elk are susceptible. Elk have a very long incubation period, so it takes a long time for elk to get the disease. Um, we know that also, um, so they're, they're, they operate, we think on the scale of who gets infected the fastest, we think white-tailed deer are probably the most affected. We think mule deer are sort of in, in between, close to white-tailed deer, and then elk are sort of on the other end. They, they don't, the, their tissues don't show up. I mentioned the retropharyngeal lymph nodes as tissues. They seem to not always be consistent in elk. And white-tailed deer, it's like bang on. You just test, test a lymph node and you, you know that that animal's infected or not. 
elk is a different scenario. They live a lot longer with the disease. We don't know, I don't think we understand why. Um, the other thing about elk is that elk are a very long-lived species, a low reproductive species, right? A, a cow might only have one calf a year if she's, if she's lucky. Um, maybe only half the cows will have a calf that survives to the next fall kind of thing. So it doesn't take as much infection in an elk population, and then the mortality eventually then happens as well. This is what people in Rocky Mountain National Park have found before those populations begin to be affected as well. And of course, they can also spread the disease to deer. So um, that's happened in Arkansas. It's happened in, in the West as well. So it's a, it's a different biology. It's a different life history for that critter, but they're all affected as well. They have a different set of genotypes that have these resistant and susceptible genotypes as well. I'm, I'm not sure I answered your question, though. Did Oh, OK. A question online? Yeah, this is a kind of a you kind of partly answered this, another policy question. If you were asked to give the Wisconsin DNR your best opinion on what they can do <laughs> to limit the spread of CWD, what would be the top three things you would tell them? Mm. I've already told them. <laughs> 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 you can tell how much they listen. <laughs> so in my opinion, um, the ways we, we need, what we need to do to combat these three things we need to do to combat this disease. One, if we find new spots, we need to get rid of them. Okay? Two, we need to reduce prevalence of the disease. And the only way biologically that I know how to do that at this point is to hammer the males really hard. And, and a, to a degree that's not acceptable to most hunters. It means we'd have few trophy animals out there. And the third thing we need to do is try to reduce the spread. So we can do two things to try to reduce the spread, and they can complement each other, or they can be done separately. Um, pretty much, we think that the disease is spread by dispersing animals. And the biggest dispersing class of animals is the yearling bucks. We have, and as the prevalence grows, the other thing that's happened is we get more and more of those dispersing bucks that are infected. So what we've done is pre we allow prevalence to grow. We've also increased the rate at which the disease is spreading across the landscape. So if we reduce prevalence, we help reduce the number of dispersing bucks, yearling bucks, that are moving the disease across the landscape. If we also reduce the density of deer, and this is where I think maybe what Wisconsin DNR did early on was probably a good thing. If we reduce the density of deer, we reduce the number of dispersing bucks that there are. And so we reduce the rate at which those animals are dispersing. So those are the, th the three things, the three goals I would try to have. Mm -hmm. A question here? Okay, you said something about um, if you cut down the deer population, that they're a renewable source, so like you're going to start fresh. But if it's in the soil, won't those new deer get it? This is the, this is the real problem with um, letting the disease get established. So... I think, I think we don't... So I talked about direct and indirect transmission. So contact transmission and through the environment. And I don't think we have a good handle on the science for that yet, how much is important when during the course of an outbreak. But what I've seen um, in the outbreak in southern Wisconsin makes me think that early in the process, contact transmission is probably the dominant way that animals are becoming infected. And as then the prevalence builds up, we get more and more environmental contamination. We get hot spots in the environment, like mineral licks or feeding areas or things like that. And then the environmental route begins to become more important. And maybe at some point there's a crossover where the environment just becomes the dominant means of transmission. We, we don't really understand that particularly in wild deer. It's something we need to try to work out. So when I say they're renewable and we get rid of them, I'm trying really talking about an early, early outbreak where we, could, where we may just have a small cluster of animals that are infected. So like New York or like in uh, northwest Wisconsin where they only found one animal, keep your fingers crossed, um, that was infected so far. You can go in and remove animals in that area. In that, this disease tends to start very locally which makes it very hard to detect on the landscape. Sometimes by the time we detect it, it's like it was in southern Wisconsin. It's already been there 20 years, and we've got 5% prevalence in animals. If you can detect it early, then you can be aggressive 
and remove deer in a local area, those deer will eventually move in from outside and repopulate, hopefully before you get an environmental um, reservoir set up. I think I missed something somewhere. You it's probably I missed it. <laughs> you could have these folded prions in certain species, animals, that don't, and they don't have CWD. So what is it, how do you detect that they have CWD then, if they have these folded protons, uh, uh, prions? Well, oh. if they, if, so you mean they have the folded, um, the misfolded prions, but they're not yet sick? Or what do you mean they're not infected? Well, all right, like, you're saying that they can have these, you know, folded prions yeah. and not be sick. Yeah, okay. So, okay. So yeah. how do you, so what tells you they have CWD then? We have to test their tissues. Because as they don't, so what we say is there's a long incubation period. So the animals have misfolded prions in their bodies, which are begin to circulate through their system. And they're not going to get sick until it actually gets into their brain, and actually until it gets fairly advanced in their brain. And so then when their brain can't function anymore. They can't drink appropriately, they can't eat appropriately, they can't recognize what's going on in their environment. They lose weight, they get skinny. Um, and so that doesn't happen until, in, in white-tailed deer, that doesn't happen until almost two years on average be, since the time they got infected. So for all that time in between, 18 months, 20 months, you'd never know. And most hunters who shoot them will say, this deer was healthy, I don't care what you say, it wasn't infected with CWD. Well, yes, it was infected. The, the, the tissues that we sampled showed that it was actually infected with the prions. It just hadn't had it long enough to get to the brain yet and cause it to act abnormally. And so during that time when they actually have infected and misfolded prions, they can actually be excreting infectious prions to other animals and, and infecting other animals, both by direct contact and then through the environment as well. And that's where we get into the rub. They're, you know, we don't wait to, they're not, they don't just shed and, and transmit disease when they get clinical. They're probably very, very early um, in the, in the, in the, after they become um, infected with the prions, they start shedding. At least six months and probably a lot earlier than that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. Uh, who's paying these people? <laughs> <laughs> um, now, Mad cow disease is similar, right? And people have gotten mad cow from cows. Do the people have the same types of, you know, is, do you see the same thing in people that you see in cows? And did they get it just from eating the meat? So um, mad cow disease is one of the good examples of what we call a food chain TSE. It goes through the food chain, right? So people got infected by eating uh, uh, infected beef. And in particular, I think what, what most people think is they got infected by eating um, things that were nervous tissue and other things like that that were used in, were very popular in meat pies and things like that in, in England. And so that's more, a, more an infect, a source of more infectious material. But the way they solved mad cow was they stopped feeding protein animal protein to cows. They were feeding animal protein to cows to supplement their diet. And that's how we got mad cow disease into the cows. And so once they cut that link, that's why if you see the regulations for feeding, for feeding animals, for feeding livestock, you can't use protein, you can't use anim other animal protein, even if it's rendered, because rendering doesn't get rid of prions. Even if it's rendered, you can't feed that kind of protein to livestock, particularly to cows. I'm not sure about sheep and those kind of things. But so, so that's how people got it. They got it through infectious material from cows before it was recognized that that's what was going on. We think the risk... So there's another disease I mentioned called Kratzel-Jakob's disease, which is called CJD. It occurs at about one in a million people. The problem with the people who got infected with mad cow disease, we now call that variant CJD because it's a little different. What happened with those is that younger people, people in their 20s and 30s, started getting infected with what would look like kreutzfeldt jakobs disease, which is typically an old age disease. It typically doesn't happen until people are in their 60s and 70s. If those young people 
hadn't gotten infected, it may have taken much longer to recognize that what the problem was going on. Because if you look at the data, the risk of people getting infected who they think consumed a lot of material is still only about one in a million. So it's very rare. About 200 and some people have died from variant Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, but millions were exposed. And it's only one particular genotype, the methionine, methionine genotype of humans who actually ever became ill with variant CJD. So this, one of the things that the human medical people are concerned about is if there are long, if there are different incubation periods in different human genotypes, will they see other cases of variant CJD later in the future? It's something they're monitoring, particularly in the UK, um, and has lots of lots of implications on the medical side for that. So it was very difficult to recognize because it was very rare, but the way they found it, it was it happens and happened in younger people. And the, the, the prion itself was somewhat different in its presentation molecularly and things like that. And there was about an eight-year, just one follow-up, one more thing. There was about an eight-year period between when mad cow peaked in cows and when variant CJD started to occur in humans. So they think the incubation period in humans for that was about eight years, to give you just some rough idea. A question here? Right here. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Blinded by the lights. <laughs> you mentioned that the North American continent and Norway both have CWD. Is there any established pattern or anything in common that has been found yet as to between both? I, I don't know too much about the Norway situation. I had some correspondence with someone recently, and this is something they're trying to figure out. Um, so their main hypotheses um, are related to people using uh, scent lures, urine scent lures in Norway. Um, I think they don't view scrapie as being a very high risk. They're concerned about it being spontaneous. I can't remember. It seemed like there was something else they were thinking about. But this is something they're trying to actively investigate and figure out as well. And so hopefully we will know that in a few years. But... Yeah, we, all of us were very surprised. Can, if you can imagine it, so the Canadians um, are very concerned about uh, C, CWD getting into to caribou herds. And um, see, it's, it's been shown in the lab, in, in, not in, in pen studies, that caribou slash reindeer are highly susceptible to CWD. And so you can imagine a contact, a disease that's spread by contact there isn't another species in North America that's more gregarious than caribou. And so one could imagine that this could have pretty devastating impacts on the caribou herd in Canada, um, which has a lot of implications for their native people who's to, for subsistence and those kind of things as well. So far, it's not quite far north enough in Canada to um, be uh, exposing the caribou, but it's something they're, they're keeping an eye on. Did I, get, did I get your answer, question? Okay. Yeah, if nothing, if nothing changes, how much time do you think we have in northern Wisconsin before this disease will be a limiting factor on our deer population? Quite a while. Um, I mean, it hasn't even gotten here yet, as far as we know. And the, the typical trajectory, as I said, is very low prevalence for quite a long period of time before it gets to ramp up. You, may, you have wolves on your side. Um, you have different habitat. Deer do different things here. Um, I've seen, interestingly, I've seen some anecdotal data from the West where they had some very severe winters. So, that, I mean, their animals are moving long distance from migration from summer to winter range, and they get some pretty severe winters. So they've had some winters where they lost a lot of animals, but they differentially lost animals that it, it, it appears, I should, I should be clear here, it appears that they lost animals differentially that were infected with CWD because after those hard winters, their CWD prevalence dropped, like precipitously, and then started to climb again. So, you know, that may be on your side as well. You may have severe enough winters that it's taking some of those animals out of the population. So it may not, it may not operate as fast here as it does in, in southern Wisconsin. But in, in any case, I would say in the beginning, it's likely to be, be rather slow. So... Not in, not in our lifetime. Another question? Um, 
it might have been a popular magazine article a year or two ago said something, they speculated that fawns might be able to get it from those that were infected, their mothers. Is there anything further on that? I don't have the latest on that. This has been something that's been talked about. There's, um, whether, so, um, so in sheep, scrapie is typically can be passed readily from the dam to the ewe, or the ewe to the, to the lamb, sorry. Um, so, I mean, people, people have thought, well, that's probably a, a likely route um, in deer as well. But what I can say is that um, even the infection rate, what we've seen from the field data, is that even the infection rate in yearling deer, so they've now had a year and a half to get the disease. If, if, if they were infected, we should be able to detect it in their lymph nodes fairly readily, if they were infected within their first year of life. And the, the prevalence rate in those yearling deer has always been considerably lower than females. And so it's, I think as prevalence increases, we're going to see more and more fawns becoming infected and more yearlings becoming infected. And it's, there, it's, it's certainly... I wouldn't be surprised if some fawns are getting it from their mothers, but it seems to be that it's not 100% in any stretch of the imagination if, that, if that's what's going on. And that's really odd to me because, okay, what other pair bond in deer is like, is like a fawn and its mother, right? I mean, she's always grooming them and those kind of things. And, and so you, you would think that why, why exactly that is going on, I, I, I can't tell you. But it, it's sort of like, this is something I didn't expect. <laughs> always get surprised. Uh, what about the environmental impact uh, on the disease? Yeah. Uh, it is more prevalent in the south than it is up here. And I would think maybe global warming may have a possible impact there. Um, in terms of in the soil and those kind of things you're talking yes. about? Yeah, whether... Uh, I, I don't have a good handle on that, to be honest. I just don't think we understand how long it persists in the soil and what factors cause it to degrade. Um, people have done some, some work where they've used uh, extract from lichens, and in the lab they can use extract from lichens and show that it sort of degrades prions. So people are working on things to try to degrade them. Um, but I don't think we understand what happens in the natural system. And so at this point, I would say I wouldn't see a major reason why the northern Wisconsin would be different than southern Wisconsin in terms of persistence of prions or a longevity of prions. But you know, that's, a, that's a real, it's kind of beyond our knowledge at this point for sure. Question here? Has there been a vaccine developed for similar diseases? No. Um, not to my knowledge, there's been, <laughs> this is another story, of course. The Canadians were working on a vaccine for chronic wasting disease. Um, and they did recently completed a trial out in Wyoming for that, for that uh, disease. And they found that the animals that were given the vaccination were eight times more likely to come down with disease than the animals that were not given the vaccination. So there's, there's something we need to learn from that. Um, but obviously that vaccine itself was not, was not a success. Um, they spent a lot of money and a lot of time um, developing that vaccine, and it had showed, shown some promise with some of their studies in, in sheep and those kind of things. There was a second vaccine that was tried that was a vaccine that was given on the uh, tongue and in the mucosal and the tissue in the mouth. Um, that was published, I think, about a year and a half ago now developed out of people in New York, and the study was done in a captive situation in, in Colorado, Colorado State. And that actually did show some promise, um, some minor promise. But, um, you know, we need to do a lot more work. There's these different genotypes that we have to think about and all those kind of things. And we, then if you get a vaccine, how do you deliver it? And, you know, it's right now, of course, it's things, vaccines typically take not only a first dose, but a second dose, and sometimes a third dose, and, and all those kind of complications. So it, it takes, people have told me it takes something like 25 years, or took 25 years to get the rabies vaccine developed and actually field tested 
to in actually order to actually apply that stuff on a fairly large scale. And so I don't think we're looking at that as a solution. We need to work on it, for sure, because we, we, we really would like to have a silver bullet out there of some kind, but, but I, I wouldn't hold out any hope for the near term on getting that, that done. There seems to be two parallel things happening with hunting. People who want CWD eliminated or suppressed and trophy hunters. And that, how compatible is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, so as I've said, the, the animals that get the highest rate of infection are older males. Um, as prevalence becomes higher, those males will die faster. Um, so we're going to have a younger age class of adult bucks in southern Wisconsin before long. And so there, there's going to be less trophy animals out there. Um, they're really, I sort of tell people, these are competing interests, and the disease is going to win. It has, it has the upper hand. So this is why we're trying to tell people that now is the time to try to do, it's past time, but... If we want to have trophy hunting in southern Wisconsin, we're going to have to figure out a way to do something about CWD because they're really at, really at odds with each other. I'm just, I'm just curious how easy it is to get a deer tested. So say you kill a deer and you want to know if it, had, or if it has early chronic wasting disease. Who do you call? How much does it cost? The, uh, the policy, as I understand it, um, is that if any hunter wants a deer tested, the DNR will do it. Um, up here, I don't know how practical it is. They may tell you, uh, yeah, you can have it tested, but drive it down to Madison. Um, the, so that's, that's free of charge, um, and that's, that's been their policy for a while. I think, personally, I would say if you're shooting a deer up here, there probably isn't a real strong reason to have it tested. Um, what the state is sort of doing to try to look for chronic wasting disease is they're, um, we, we call it targeted surveillance. They're actually relying on you folks and other people that when you see a sick animal on the landscape, to call them and they'll come and get it and then they'll test it. And that's a good way of finding CWD because you're finding basically the clinical cases. So in, anyway, in theory, to answer your question, in theory, they should test it. But up here, you might have a hard time getting that done. Now, they did, this last year, they did actually try a new experiment where they mailed out kits to hunters. That 50 hunters got kits where the hunters could remove the lymph nodes themselves and send it in for testing. And so if you could get into that uh, pool, that would be another easy way to do it as well. But again, I think that's mostly geared towards where we know we have the disease already. Northern Illinois um, has been using culling uh, to try to eradicate or control the disease. Are you familiar with their results? I'm familiar with some of them. So we just published a paper. Um, let me back up a little bit. There's been several papers coming out of Illinois comparing Wisconsin and Illinois. Um, the problem with comparing two, C two different CWD outbreaks is that you have to be very careful where you draw a boundary on the landscape. If I, draw, uh, if I say, what's the CWD prevalence in Wisconsin, it's probably less than a tenth of a percent of all the deer in Wisconsin. But if I say, what's the CWD prevalence in the core area in south central Wisconsin, it's more like six or seven percent, maybe higher. So where you draw that boundary is a key part of that process. In my opinion, the people in Illinois who said that Illinois was doing a better job than Wisconsin drew a different boundary than was reasonable. So we just published a paper comparing um, the infection rate and the prevalence rate from what we think is a comparable area, what we call the core area from Illinois, where it, we think it probably started and is most comparable to our core area in southern Wisconsin. And if you compare those two sets of data, their prevalences are equivalent to ours, and their infection rates are basically equivalent to ours. Now, that was data that ended in about 2011, and I don't know, I haven't kept enough track of those small areas in Illinois to tell you what's happened 
since then, where their prevalence has continued to increase. One thing I would say is that their, their efforts to go after hotspots on the landscape, if you think about it in the big context of prevalence, they're reducing prevalence at the small scale, which is probably a good thing to do. The other thing they're doing is they're reducing deer density, which probably then helps this issue with spread. But they still have spread of the disease as well. So whether we can tackle those, those things very easily is, is real questionable. So I'm fairly skeptical of some of the claims that sharpshooting has been the panacea <laughs> that sometimes I've seen in the literature. So um, the molecular biology. These, you're getting, you're the, getting the way genes, out of my subject here. <laughs> the, the genes or the proteins across these different mammalian species, what degree of relatedness or homology? And are we talking about monomers, dimers, trimers? Sorry, um, you're way out of my league on this one. I, I used to go to the molecular people's talks, and I would just go, oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I really... People are looking at those kind of things, but I, I, it's, they're way smarter than me. And if you understand it, you're way smarter than me, too. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, so two questions for you. You talked a little bit about testing and how quickly the disease shows up in the various tissues. Um, the first question is, if I have an animal tested and it comes back negative that it doesn't have the disease, what are the odds that it may actually have the disease? Well, there's, like I said, there's, there's probably a window there before, again, assuming we're testing the retropharyngeal lymph nodes, which is the easiest and earliest tissue that we know of and most consistent. Um, there's probably a window of three to four months when the animal could be infected um, and you're going to get a negative test. Um, there's always issues with the amount of tissue and those kind of things as well. But assuming everything is good and the tests are all done well, blah, 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 there's, there's a short window of time. I mean, the other, the other part of that would be, well, if, if, if it's that early in the infection process, it's not in the lymph nodes yet, it's probably not going to be one of your more highly infectious deer either. So it's sort of, a, sort of a mixed bag there. But yes, there is a window when an animal could be positive, and we just can't figure that out. And then the second part would be, we talked a little bit about how it's spreading uh, in the main zone <clears throat> down by Madison, you talked about the dispersal of the yearling bucks. What, what would be a, a range of spread per year? Is it five miles, 10 miles? We, we, there's, a, there's a study being done right now. To tr it's a very difficult question because what we're trying to look at, we have a, you have, think about this as a distribution of a disease on the landscape. And it looks like, kind of looks like a big mound, right? and maybe a big gravel pile where it's piled up in the middle and sort of spreads out. What we're trying to figure out is how fast that tail is spreading. And there's not much data in that tail, right? So it's really hard to figure out. I mean, if you have, you know, uh, you may test an area here where you have less than 1% prevalence in that tail, and you may move five miles away, you can't test enough animals to, to show that it's really different, right, typically. And so that's a really, really tough question to answer. There's some people now who are working on some what they call dispersion models, sort of trying to figure out some of those things. And I have not seen their results yet. Hopefully, they'll get some information on that. We did some very simple things um, in one of our papers where we tried to look at what our best guesstimate is when different places on the landscape might have gotten initially infected and then looked at the distance between those and used that to try to measure the rate of spread. And what we found is that it was about, oh, about a mile per year. But I'm guessing that that probably only applies to very, er very early on in the disease. And that as the disease has grown in prevalence, that, that probably that rate, my guess, no data, that guess is that rate of spread has probably increased. One of the th other things we see with the, with the rate of spread is that um, highways and rivers um, to actually tend to be a little bit of a barrier. They're not enough of a barrier to stop the disease, but they're a barrier to gene flow of deer, so deer don't survive very well, quite as well, as they disperse, try to disperse across a big highway like 9094 down to between Madison and Chicago. 
or they don't do so well across some of the rivers as well. And that seems to prevent or, or reduce, it doesn't prevent, sort of reduces a bit the rate at which the disease spreads. So if you look at where the disease is spreading, sometimes it kind of parallels and, and spreads north and south along some of those river and, and highway corridors, which sort of, again, sort of fits this pattern of, of just being dispersed by, by uh, or being moved by dispersing animals. <laughs> 